Well, we're about ready to start our debate. We have a little technical issue to, to resolve here. And uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Dave Lehman. Uh, we already introduced uh, Dr. Tommy Ice. And uh, Dave, uh, quite a guy. I've known this guy for how long? Years. Used to be on the campus at Purdue. But David graduated from the University of Minnesota with an engineering degree. He worked for McDonnell Douglas before attending and graduating from Grace Theological Seminary with a Master of Divinity degree. David also received a Master's of Biblical Counseling from Grace. He went on and earned two PhDs. He worked for and taught HVAC engineering at Purdue University. He still consults for engineering companies, but his love is Bible, apologetics, and Bible prophecy. We've had an issue with our HVAC system. I'll have to talk with you about that afterwards. <clears throat> David taught creation ism, cults, and world religions every week for 20 years while on the campus of Purdue University. Dave now lives in Southern California where he, his focus has been debating atheists and evolutionists. David has had over 25 debates with, on those subjects. He has authored and compiled many notebooks and manuals on numerous subjects that are available here at our, uh, at our conference. Now, if you guys would come on up uh, and take your positions here, I, uh, Tommy, we need to check your. This is something we've never done before. Uh, something I've always wanted to do, uh, because it really brings issues to the surface and helps us to to understand and grapple with and and uh, do more research and study on our own. So. Um, We have to switch back and forth uh, with, with the PowerPoint so that they... Is his working? Huh? Just give you a little format here. Well, he's figuring his technology. And Lord, we just ask that you bless our technology here and uh, help everything to work in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, this debate is on imminency, which means the Lord could return at any moment. Uh, Dr. Ice takes the position that he could come at any moment, which is, has been a historical perspective of, of the church. Dave Lehman, Dr. Dave Lehman says... No, he's coming, but there's certain things that have to be fulfilled first. So Tommy will begin uh, with 20 minutes on describing the positive aspect of the coming of the Lord, the imminency aspect. And then Dave will spend 20 minutes with his opening statement. And then there will be some rebuttals from each one and uh, then a cross-examination, and then questions and answers from you, the audience. We'll have a few minutes for the audience to ask questions. And then closing statements. They'll each have seven minutes for their closing arguments. Now, I've got a uh, smartphone, and I hope it's smart on this, <laughs> because I'm going to use this as, as, as our timer and you can you can time out there if you want to also and something uh, some some alarm will go off on this if if they go over but i'll give you a three minute heads up when you're when you're about finished 
So without further ado, we'll ask uh, Tommy Ice to present his opening statement. Well, good to be here and good to talk about this issue. And I want to first start with, you know, a definition of eminence. Uh, and that is that the Lord could come at any moment and that there are no necessary intervening events that must precede uh, his coming in the air to rapture the church. And uh, that this word does not appear in the King James Bible. It's a Latin word. But we believe, that those of us that believe in eminence, believe that it is a biblical concept, just like Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. <clears throat> but it is certainly a biblical concept. And uh, however, in the New American Standard, it, it, they translate a word with eminence. Second uh, P- Peter 1 14 said, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Now, <clears throat> this translates the Greek word takus, or takus, and uh, that is a word that's used in the book of Revelation, and uh, for I am coming quickly, etc., and things like this. Paul Feinberg, another pre-tribulationalist, defines imminent as uh, the coming of Christ at the rapture may occur at any moment. This means that the, there are no prophesied events that must take place before Christ can come. There may be events that do take place, but they don't have to, uh, and meaning Christ could come at any moment. So we see the rapture of the church <clears throat> has a clear uh, description or qualitative uh, description where Christ comes in the air. He doesn't return to planet Earth. This is why it's not the second coming, because that's when he returns to planet Earth, uh, and we go up to meet him in the air. That is the church. And the purpose of the rapture <clears throat> is to end the temporary church age where Jew and Gentile are co equal in Christ so that God can then return, as James said in Acts 15, and rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. In other words, fulfill the Davidic covenant for the nation of Israel during the tribulation or 70th week. So there will be believers after the rapture, and so the rapture ends the church age, and there will be an interval between it, and uh, the covenant begins the tribulation, the signing of the covenant. And so, therefore, you can see, as I picture here, uh, rapture passages I went through years ago and made a list. I have since learned I might have left one or two off uh, of the rapture side. These passages either teach the rapture or they uh, refer to the rapture, in my humble opinion. And notice none of them are in the gospel because the rapture is not talked about except in John 14 is the only place. Jesus introduces the rapture the night before he was killed just as he introduced other church age truth in the upper room discourse. And everything he introduces in the upper room discourse is brand new stuff related to the church. And then you compare second coming passages and this is only a partial list. And when you look, once again, qualitatively at the differences of the events, I think these graphics depict that. The rapture is us going up to meet him at any moment and then take him back to the Father's house. (coughs) And the second coming is where the church, who is already up there, as described in Revelation 19, uh, comes back with Christ all the way to planet Earth. And that's talked about in the Old Testament in the Olivet Discourse and in various other passages. And therefore, when you look at this idea of eminence, well, goodness, I got these out of order here. Uh, It's an event that could, but not necessarily take place at any moment. Uh, Soon is not the same as imminent. Those are different. An imminent event could happen soon, or it may not happen for over 2,000 years. No prophetic event must take place before an imminent event could happen. The rapture is imminent while Christ's second coming is not. And and we believe that 
this is the best understanding is, is that you have two events, the rapture introduced in conjunction with the mystery doctrines of the church and in conjunction with the church. And so it was part of God's plan always, but it was hidden as were all the mysteries, all the uh, descriptive qualities of the, uh, the church age were hidden, but always part of God's plan and revealed in the New Testament. And that's why Christ introduces them to that uh, at the beginning. And so eminence passages include some of the following. Oh, this is out of order. I'll just put them all up. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I know what I did. I, made, I, I italicized some of these and therefore messed with their order. So you have the word e, uh, in 1 Corinthians, and notice these only appear in the epistles. And I would like, let me just point out that because there are no signs or events preceding the rapture, then there's nothing to look for. And there are no passages related to the rapture that says that we are to look or watch for signs. All of those passages that talk about watching for signs relate to the second coming. Because if you're in the tribulation, there are going to be hundreds of indicators that you're proceeding through that seven-year period to the second coming. And so the rapture, they're eagerly awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this word awaiting eagerly is a word that relates to a person staying up late because they don't know when someone's going to come. And therefore, since they don't know when they're going to come, they're, they're staying up until they do come and usually it, it, means, it implies it's past your bedtime when you do that. And then you have the word Maranatha that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. In fact, this is a Greek term, I mean a Hebrew term, that was used in a Greek culture, which shows you that it must have been an important word in the early church. And, it, and this Aramaic word means our Lord come, but in its historic usage, it implies an eagerness or a urgency. And so they had uh, developed this term in the early church, and Paul uses it in one of his middle epistles in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, where he simply says, Maranatha, our Lord come. And it implies eminence as well. I forgot to mention that 1 Corinthians 1, 7 shows they're looking for Jesus Christ. They're awaiting Christ, whereas if they were going to go through any part of the 70th week of Daniel, then they would be looking for the signing of the covenant or events that would precede his coming. And so that's what we mean by eminence, that nothing else has to happen for this event to take place. And then we see in Philippians 3.20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we all... We, also, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so you're going to see repetitively throughout uh, these rapture-related comments in the epistles that they are always waiting for Christ. Therefore, nothing else has to precede him. That's why it's imminent. And we see in Philippians 4, Five, he says, the Lord is near. That's the Greek word engase, meaning at hand, within reach. I like to use these illustrations. Uh, for the Minnesota Vikings and the Buffalo Bills, the Super Bowl was imminent. It was at hand. They were in the Super Bowl four times, but they lost every time. So at near doesn't mean that it's arrived. Jesus talks about his ministry being he, uh, the kingdom of God was at hand, but it never arrived. The kingdom of God was at hand because Christ was there, but because Israel rejected him, it hasn't arrived yet. It's postponed. But to the generation that Christ came to of Jewish people, it was at hand within reach. And then we see 1 Thessalonians 1.10, which was the second epistle that Paul wrote. He wrote Galatians first. And then he wrote First and Second Thessalonians within months of each other. And right off the bat in First and Second Thessalonians, he, he reveals the church's eschatology or their view of prophecy. And he talks about how the Thessalonians turn from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. There's that same word uh, that's used to wait eagerly or to stay up late waiting for it. 
And uh, so Titus 2.13, you may say, well, there it says to look, but that word is actually the same word, waiting, and the English translators uh, translate looking, but it, it's really the word waiting for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So here we see that uh, this idea of waiting for Christ uh, <clears throat> could not apply to the second coming, but it implies, therefore we draw the idea that he could come at any moment, otherwise you're not waiting for him if something has to precede that. And we see that this idea of eagerly waiting pictures eager expectation indicated by the head bent forward to catch the first glimpse of an advancing procession. Uh, Godet, a commentator, said it is one of the, the uh, those admirable words that the Greek language easily forms. It means to wait with the head raised and the eyes fixed on that point of the horizon from which the expected object is to come. And so we see more passages that teach this. They're probably out of order too, they are. And um, that's what you do when you make last minute changes. And we see in James 5, which is the earliest epistle that was written around 50, A.D. 50, he says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See, the rapture is a coming of the Lord. He's coming in the air. Uh, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. There's that word in gaze, within reach. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. And <clears throat> I think I've used this illustration here before, but I'll use it again. Uh, when I was younger, I was in a what's called an airborne unit in the Army National Guard, and we jumped out of perfectly good airplanes. And we would go through a six-stage process uh, to do that. And when you reached the sixth stage, that meant you were one minute from the drop zone, and whoever was first in line, the, the jump master would say, stand in the door. Why? Because standing in the door meant the next event was you're going to jump out of the airplane. And so in, the, in that same way, this biblical passage illustrates that from the earliest epistle, Jesus was standing in the door. It's the next event that uh, the church is look, waiting for. And so that teaches eminency as well. In 1 Peter 1.13, he says, Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fix your hope completely on this. We're told by all kinds of Christians that, you know, people like you are so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Well, it's interesting in the book of Revelation, it talks about the earth dwellers or the unbelievers, but the, the heaven dwellers mentioned a couple of times in Revelation are the believers. Why? Does that make you no earthly good? No, it gives your priorities straight. By looking to heaven where God was issuing his commands in the tribulation in that context, uh, the same is true today. Our citizenship is in heaven as we saw back in Philippians. How many of you have been there? None of you, right. That's the point. Uh, that's where we're going and that heavenly mindedness makes us get our priorities straight here in the nasty now and now on planet earth so that whatever's done for Christ will last in the by, the by and by or sweet by and by or something like that. And so you're to fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, your hope is not in the things of this world. Your hope is in Christ. And, that, and as Romans 8 says, we're waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, for the removal of the curse, for the resurrection of the body, we will, which for the church age believers will happen at the rapture because we're groaning under this. And he talks about the curse. <clears throat> and then he quotes Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good in relation to the church according to God's plan. God is even now in a cursed earth working all things together for the good according to his plan for you and I as believers. And so that's why our focus is to be on Christ himself. And Jude 21 talks about waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And so once again, the waiting 
<coughs> idea, uh, we deduce from that, induce from it, uh, imminency. And then you have the I am coming quickly passages, like in Revelation 3.11, 22, 7, 12, 20, verse 20. I am coming quickly. Now, preterists want this to, preterists are people who believe the book of Revelation was fulfilled through the events of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. It's a Latin word meaning past or gone by. And once again, another example of a Latin term that describes a belief system. And uh, so, I am coming quickly, they say, means I'm coming soon or stuff, stuff like that. That's not what the word takas means. And in Revelation 22, 17, you have the same thing. These are teaching imminency. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In other words, quickly has the idea of suddenness. And you see, uh, for example, that this word, I think I've got this stuff here. Let me check. Uh, yes. You, you have this word in... Uh, the, the standard Greek lexicon, uh, takas uh, here, and it says a very brief period of time with focus on speed or an activity or event, speed, quickness, swiftness, haste. In other words, uh, with speed. Then we see quickly at once without delay. And I like to use another football illustration here. You can be a big 350-pound lineman and be quick, but you're probably not going to be fast. You see the difference? Quickness means suddenness. Uh, and some of those guys can get to the quarterback rather suddenly. And uh, a quarterback has to be eminently aware that they're always around. And here, a, a different form of the word it says it's pertaining to a very brief period of time with focus on speed of an activity or event. Quick, swift, speedy, uh, quickly at a rapid rate, without delay, quickly at once. And it's interesting, it's used in Revelation 1.1. When you go to the grammar that uh, goes along with that lexicon that I was showing out of the University of Chicago Press, uh, Bloss de Bruner talk about how there are four types of adverbs. And an adverb of manner, it uses the tachus family as its illustration, how something happens, not when something is going to happen. How is it going to happen? Suddenly or quickly. Therefore, you're to always be ready, is what the book of Revelation, this is not a quote-unquote timing text as the preterists try to argue. And so uh, that's simply the argument that I would put forth for eminence. It's okay to finish early. Uh, I'm waiting, Eight, 18 for, minutes. That's waiting for Christ <laughs> at any moment. Thank you, uh, Tommy. Uh, David, you have 20 minutes for your opening arguments. Can I use his minutes? <laughs> no, they're mine. And, I'm not going to give them to you. Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay, I titled mine The End of Eminence. <laughs> Tommy, I really look up to you. I have to. You're a foot taller than I am. The, the, the end of eminence is when Christ returns. <laughs> Jesus did not teach eminence. Jesus Christ did not teach he would return at any moment after Pentecost. He made it clear to his disciples that they would not see his return, that Peter would die first, that the gospel would be preached to all the world, that he would build his church, that his disciples would be persecuted and martyred, that Paul would go to Rome, that John would prophesy again by writing the book of Revelation, and the city of Jerusalem would be trodden down until the times of the Gentiles was fulfilled. And that didn't happen until 1967, so that's over 1,900 years that we know for sure that he couldn't come back. Now, if you're using all of these prophecies, these statements in the New Testament to say that he could come back at any moment, we know that's not true. They were lying to you. Jesus told his disciples they would not see him return. He said, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and he will not see it. Jesus said, Peter would be martyred, but when you are old, you shall stretch down forth your hands, and another shall dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Now this he spoke, signifying by what manner of death he should glorify God. 
Jesus said other disciples would be martyred. Yes, the hour comes that whosoever kills you will think he offers service unto God. Jesus said apostles would make disciples of na other nations, of all nations. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. We're not in making disciples until we've done that. It took 11 disciples, Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, and other evangelists, and thousands of believers a few decades just to preach the gospel to the entire known world. Paul said in his letter to Colossians that the gospel had been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. Jesus said he would build his church. Historians tell us that it took several decades to build the church. Jesus told Paul he would testify in Rome. Jesus visited Paul in Jerusalem after he appeared before the Sanhedrin and told him that he would preach the gospel in Rome. Be of good cheer, for as you have testified concerning me at Jerusalem, so must you bear witness also at Rome. Jesus said Jerusalem would be captured. And of course, we know that's true. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So Gentiles would control Jerusalem until the times of the Gentiles was fulfilled. It's obvious that Jesus could not rapture the church until Jerusalem was captured by the Gentiles, which didn't happen until the Sixth Day War in 1967. So Jesus said John would prophesy by writing the book of Revelation. He didn't write the book of Revelation until about 96 A.D. So, and of course... Uh, History shows that, you know, this, this is what happened. Harold Lenzel explained that why no one today should believe in the doctrine of eminence. We can understand and excuse earlier earnest students of the word who were wrong about this matter, but we have further light and can now see that those things, those who held any moment rapture were incorrect in their interpretation of scripture. That's his book, The Gathering Storm. There, in other words, in the latter days, knowledge will increase. Well, I believe knowledge has increased. In fact, uh, knowledge is supposedly doubled every 12 hours now, or getting close to that. But it also means that we understand things better now that we see the biblical fulfillment of prophecy coming forth. Now we can understand more. Knowledge increases about our understanding of how the future events of the Bible are coming to pass. And there's parables of the talents. We see that as also Jesus taught against the soon return through the parables of the talents, the parable about the nobleman who went to a distant country to receive a kingdom and then returned, and the Olivet Discourse parable about a man who went on a journey, a long journey. These also refute the doctrine of eminence. A certain nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself, and then he returned. And now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The phrases, went to a distant country, after a long time, they're the key. All dispensational theologians agree that the parables concern the church. Now we understand the phrases, went to a distant, after a long time, mean more than 1,900 years. They heard Jesus read Isaiah 61, which said that there would be a long period between his first and second comings. Now, this was the first sermon he preached in the synagogue, and he's quoting from Isaiah 61. And you notice that he quotes the first part. He doesn't quote the last part. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meat. He has sent me to build up, bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he stops, closes it, and sits down. But if you were to read the rest of it, it would be to the day of vengeance of our God. That's the tribulation. And it's interesting that the 2,000 years, 2,000 plus years of the church age is very similar in proportion to the seven years as a year is to a day. So I believe that he is saying, in a sense, that this, this is a, this is a year-long, at least, uh, process, the Christian, Christian dispensation. For the seven parables of Matthew, chapter 13, proved the rapture was not an imminent event. In the first four parables, Jesus explained that a long period would elapse between his resurrection and his return. The first parable is about Jesus and the apostles sowing the gospel. The second parable concerns the fact that the tares, the unsaved, would grow up alongside the wheat. That takes some time. And they would mature until harvest, the second coming. The third parable is about the mustard seed. It would take the smallest seed in the Middle East at that time, yet it grew into a large tree. Now, this is a symbol. A tree is a symbol of Christendom, and the birds are <clears throat> usually symbolic of the unsaved, and we see that the birds are resting in the branches of this huge tree, but it takes a long time for the tree to grow. 
So the fourth parable is about the apostasy or the leaven in the church. Paul knew that Jesus could not return at any moment during his final visit to the church of Ephesus around 60 AD. He warned the elders, take heed unto yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit hath made you bishops to feed the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock from among your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And one might argue that this could only take a few years, but we know that it actually usually takes many years for false teachers to work their way into a church and lead people astray. Romans 13, 11, Paul did not teach in his letter to Romans that Jesus could return at any moment, and knowing this, the season that is already, that already it is time for you to awaken out of sleep, for now is the salvation nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. The word nearer simply means that the return of Christ is nearer than it has been. This is kind of common sense statement. The phrase day is at hand should be translated, I believe. <clears throat> the day is draw near. Paul was saying that there is a time, time nighttime, do, time of doing evil is almost over. Time of doing good is we, we should do this and we should live holy lives. It's been over 1,900 years since the letter was written. The rapture has not taken place. No one can believe that 1,900 years is near or at hand. It may be to God, but the, God, the Bible wasn't written to God. It was written to us. Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, Even so ye also, when ye see these things, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Every statement in the New Testament about the timing and return of Jesus is a reference to this statement by, by Jesus. And you have to realize that when these prophets... When prophets were speaking, as Second Peter tells us, they were carried away to a certain place in history, and they're looking down at the event from that perspective. Yeah, it is nigh. This is called the law of first mention. Jesus said that when things he spoke of in the Olivet Discourse start to take place. Now, that's the two world wars, the birth of the nation of Israel, the time of his return is at hand. Well, yes, of course it is. When Jesus said the day is at hand, he is making reference to the statement by Jesus when Paul said that, in the Olivet Discourse. In other words, he was saying that when his readers see the events described in that discourse start to take place, they would know that the return of Jesus is at hand. Now, James, James used an analogy of a farmer to explain that it would be some time before Jesus would return. He emphasized the need to be patient three times and to wait for his return. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband Man waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient over it, until it receives the early and latter rain. Be patient and establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Most teachers of eminence miss the object of the phrase or the passage, eminence. James is admonishing his believers to be patient. Why? Because the rapture was a long way to the way. The phrase, coming the Lord's at hand, does not mean that Jesus could return at any moment. It means that his return is certain, a goose. That's what it means. Jesus could not return around the time James wrote his letter, 36 AD, or maybe a little later, because the temple had not been destroyed. Remember, Jesus prophesied the temple would be destroyed. James did not teach the doctrine of eminence. He taught that it was an event that would certainly take place, and that's the only thing that makes sense from the context. First Peter 4, 7, the passage appears to support the doctrine of eminence, but a closer look reveals it does not. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound mind and be of sober unto prayer. Above all things, be fervent in your love among yourselves, for the love covers a multitude of sins. If Peter meant that the end of all things was at hand in 64 AD when he wrote this first letter, he was lying to you. No one can believe that 1945 years is at hand. It the only way the passage and other passages that use similar phrases can make sense if they're not time references. Instead, the statements of, the, uh, being statements of time, they're being statements of, statements of certainty. If we substitute certain for at hand, the passage becomes crystal clear, but the end of all things is certain. The only ones who believe these phrases are at hand are the preterists. Second Peter 2, Peter promised prophesied around 64 to 68 A.D. that false teachers would sneak into the church, introduce destructive heresies, denying the Lord Jesus. Peter knew that it would take some time for these things to be fulfilled. Remember, he wrote his letter a couple years before he was martyred. A few decades later, John wrote the book of Revelation. It was confirmed. 
Peter prophesied that in the last days men would ridicule the promise of his return. This may be one of the problems because this is what it says, that in the last days mockers shall come with mockery walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? You've been telling us, Tommy, that it's been supposed to come at any time since the prophecies were given and it still hasn't. Where is the promise of his coming? For from the day the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Of course, to take swallow when the fathers fell asleep, that's at least a couple generations. For this they willingly forget that their heavens were from old and the earth compacted out of water and amidst water by the word of God. Peter knew that he would grow old and die before Jesus would return. He also knew when he wrote this second letter that there would be an indeterminate time before this prophecy about the mockers and false teachers would be fulfilled because he talks about the fathers. The period would have to be several decades. Since the fathers fell asleep, everything has remained the same, just as it was from the beginning of creation. Now, the Old Testament teaches this as well. In fact, there's no passage that teaches doctrine of eminence, and there are several passages that teach just the opposite. Isaiah wrote around 700 B.C. that the day of Jehovah is at hand. It does not seem correct that 2,700 years is near or at hand. The only meaning that makes sense is that it would be certain to come to pass. 2,700 years is not near. To, and so Isaiah wrote in that the, the city of Damascus is about to be destroyed, yet it, had been more, it has been more than 2,700 years, and it's still a thriving city. It's obvious that the word about has nothing to do with time. It has to do with certainty. Isaiah prophesied that Jehovah is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. It should be translated, for behold, the Jehovah will certainly come out of his place. King James translators rendered, For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall also shall disclose their blood and shall no more cover her stain. Ezekiel also wrote, The day of Jehovah is near. For the day is near, even the day of Jehovah. This is the tribulation. It shall be a clay of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. This is a prophecy of the tribulation, not local judgment, because it is a time of doom for the nations. The nations to be judged are Egypt, Ethiopia, Put, Lud, Arabia, Libya. These are the nations that team up with Gog and Magog to attack Israel in the battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38.5. Only Ethiopia and Put are mentioned in chapter 38 of Ezekiel, but it's understood that these nations will be in the league with Gog and Magog. Joel prophesied that in the day of Jehovah is at hand. He also wrote that the day of Jehovah cometh, for it is nigh at hand. If he meant the tribulation was near, time-wise, he was mistaken. Yet if he meant that it was certain that Christ would come to judge the world, he was correct. Obadiah prophesied of the second coming of Jesus, for the day of Jehovah is near upon all nations. Obadiah was saying what Joel said, that the judgment of Jehovah is certain and no one can escape it. He did not mean it was near time-wise. Haggai used the phrase, a little while, Haggai 2.6. Concerning the second coming of Messiah, it's hard to believe that 2,500 years is a little while. This phrase was used to remind people that there would be a day of judgment. The context is vengeance. God is reminding Israel that no matter how bad things may be, they shall not lose hope, but trust in him. He will judge the wicked and reward the faithful. These passages could not be saying the Lord Jesus would return to judge the world in a short period of time. How could he come to judge the world before he came to die for the world? No one today would dare say the second coming of Jesus Christ was eminent during the Old Testament dispensation based on the phrases that seem to say that because he had yet to come for the first time to die for mankind. We also know that Christ could not have returned to judge the world until the fourth kingdom of Daniel's prophecy, Rome, was established. When these prophets wrote, the third kingdom of Greece had not yet arisen. If the words of the Old Testament, near and about and a little while, have to do with the timing of the rapture and the second coming, neither do the similar words that are used in the New Testament. We know this is because it has been 1,900 years since the New Testament was written and Christ has not returned. That's one reason. They have to do with certainty, not nearness of those events. Another way to look at the passages, which I mentioned, is that the use of these words imply an event that will take place in the near future is to understand that the prophet is carried forward by the Holy Spirit, 1 Peter 1.21, and what he saw in the vision was about to take place. It may be at some time before these prophecies are fulfilled, a world government, a world economy, world church will not spring up overnight. It's most likely they'll take a few years at least to establish a new world order. In conclusion, Christians should keep a close eye on news, watch the creation of the new world order. They should be prepared to increase spiritual warfare. They'll fight 
As the tribulation draws closer, we must always keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is omniscient. And he knew that Christ was not scheduled to return for over 1,900 years when he inspired Paul, James, Peter, and John to write their letters. The Holy Spirit did not deceive the disciples into thinking Christ could return in their lifetime, and in no way did he seek to have millions of Christians throughout the church age misled into believing Christ could return at any moment with no warning signs preceding his return. Now we talk about a gap. Jesus taught the rapture and the start of the tribulation take place on the same 24-hour day. This was, as it came to pass in the days of Noah, even so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day of Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, even as it came to pass in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they brought, bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But in the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and it destroyed them all. Now, if that's a literal 24-hour day, there's no gap. And so what some of the people who believe in a gap have done is they've moved that passage in Luke 17 and, Luke 20 and, and Matthew 24, they've moved it to the end of the tribulation, but you can't do that either because they're not going to be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, seven women clinging to one man. They're going to have to have the mark in order to buy and sell anything, and they're not going to be building and planning much of anything because they're going to be dodging 130-pound hailstones. Remember Lot's wife, whosoever shall seek to gain his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. What causes peace and safety? I will close with this, and I'm asking Tommy a question. What causes the peace and safety of 1 Thessalonians 5.3? But, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And we know that the day of the Lord cometh. So we're talking about the tribulation. What is causing, what is the cause of that peace and safety? We obviously don't have peace and safety right now. There's at least 10 major wars going on. So I'll, with that, I'll close. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, Tommy, you have uh, eight minutes for rebuttal. Yeah, I'm amazed at the way he just intertwines the rapture and the second uh, coming passages. I made the statement in my opening that I do not believe any of the Olivet Discourse relates to the rapture, but that was the primary basis of his arguments. So those don't relate to what I'm saying. Also... Um, by the way, all the apostles died, except for John, by 68, is based on church, the information we have in church tradition. And uh, people wouldn't have known the status of each of the apostles. And plus, Christ's statement about uh, Peter's death was stated suppositionally. What if I kept you around? Or was that John? That was John, rather. But the same would be true with them. Also, we believe that there is a gap of time between the rapture and beginning of the tribulation. So many of the things, A.D. 70, uh, if the rapture had happened early, it could have, would have happened in that interval between the rapture and the second coming. There was a clear transition period in the early church. Also, uh, the fact is that Paul wants believers, the New Testament writers want believers to always be ready whether or not, uh, and God would work out all of these kinds of things. Kind of like he said, uh, 40 days and then it will be destroyed, an absolute statement. Well, it wasn't because they repented. And so God would have worked in that way. AD 70 is no problem. Um, Revelation could have been written. It obviously wasn't. It was written to the church. The church was still there, but that wouldn't impact imminency because all those other uh, apostles were dead, and, and it was written at that point in history, A.D. 95. Uh, the early church held to imminence very strongly. If you, That's the clear consensus of the early church fathers. They had a confused eschatology. Uh, they held other views that contradicted imminence because they tended to believe in what's called intra tribulationism, that they were in the tribulation, but the, the consensus of early church scholars is that the church believed Jesus could come back at any moment. 
And uh, he used that passage in Daniel, knowledge will increase. That's not talking about the multiplication of knowledge or speed. If you look in the context, that passage is talking about how the book of Daniel needs to be preserved because the Jews aren't going to believe until the tribulation. And uh, when they, during the tribulation, they will read the book of Daniel and knowledge will increase. Their understanding and information about what's going to happen and uh, they will run to and fro telling each other what's going on. That's what that passage means. It's not that uh, view that knowledge increases ever how many months or days or whatever. All the parables, I believe, relate to Israel and the program for Israel. None of them relate directly to the church. That's, Jesus said that in Matthew 13. He said that I'm going to speak to this people, Israel, because while seeing they cannot see and having ears they cannot hear. And so he spoke from that point on after chapter 12 when the Jewish people rejected him. They spoke to him in parables. So they all relate to Israel. Yes, we can talk about the parable of the soils and all of that and how a lot of that uh, relates to the same dynamic that's at work during the church age. But the inner advent age that's being talked about there includes a tribulation period. So once again, if there's a gap of time, which I believe there is, and almost all pre-tribulationists believe that, I've been the director of the Pre-Trib Research Center for over 25 years, and uh, we talk about this ever so often, and everybody I know except one person, Robert Thomas, he's 99 now, uh, does not believe in a gap. He's the only one I know of all these, you name them, we've had them at the pre-trib conference believe that there's a, a gap of time between the rapture and the uh, start of the tribulation. He had a, a Isaiah 61, he applied the year, the day year theory, I couldn't believe it. You know, that's historicism, he's mixing in interpretive approaches into some of his things, uh, that a day is a thousand years, and therefore it would be, uh, it says one day there in Isaiah, therefore it should be a thousand years. Uh, mustard seed, the same thing, Israel, the, and it includes the inner advent age, which includes the tribulation, as I said. Um, You know, I, I would like to ask him if, he, if Christ can come at any moment. Or does he have to wait for, apparently he has to wait for all these things, which undermines, he believes in pre-trib, and I don't know why. He's just undermined everything that it stands on. Um, the Olivet Discourse, starting in verse 4 through 31 of Matthew 24, refers to the tribulation. I don't hold that view that it refers to the uh, inner advent age. I believe it. the earthquakes and famines and all of that parallel the bowl judgments, the first five bowl judgments in the book of Revelation, which are in the tribulation period. So I don't, I, that argument is meaningless to me at least in most pre-tribbers. Uh, he even tried to talk about some Old Testament passages and uh, the James passage does teach eminence. Uh, I didn't use 1 Peter 4 or 2 Peter 3. Those are talking about the second coming, both of those passages, not the rapture. And, <clears throat> you know, I'd like to know why New Testament believers were told to wait. What were they waiting for? Apparently for all these events to take place. But that's not what the passage says. He didn't speak once about what he says. And how come no translation translates these with certainty? You know, why do we have all of these English translations and other translations that translate them in the way I read them, to wait for his son from heaven and uh, things? You know, there's no imminency in the Old Testament. Uh, Paul did hope that the rapture would occur in his lifetime in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. He says that this present body is like a tent, a temporary, and the resurrection body is like a house, a permanent dwelling, and he would hope to not be found unclothed. And he's saying that he hopes the rapture comes in his lifetime. So it was a possibility for the apostle Paul there 
Um, and the day of the Lord in First Thessalonians 5 comes suddenly not on the church because they're sons of light, but on the unbelievers. In fact, in Revelation 16, I think it's verse 18 around in there, after you've had gone through all the seal, trumpet, and six of the seven bowl judgments, he talks about he's coming like a thief in the night. And who's, who does that refer to? The unbelievers who are never ready. That's the whole point. So it's not talking about uh, believers. It doesn't have an implication for the rapture. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, David, you have uh, eight minutes to respond. We have some things that have to be fulfilled before Christ can come back. The destruction of Russia, Islam, and Egypt in Ezekiel 38, 1 through 39, um, 16, 30, 1 through 5. The first conversion of Israel and the nations, Ezekiel 39, 7. After they see what God does to rescue them, all of a sudden they will believe in God. Many of them will become Christians. Many of them will just believe in God. They know that God saved them. They're not sure exactly who God is yet but they will, most of them, become saved at the end of the tribulation. The rebuilding of the ancient city of Babylon in Zechariah 5, 5 through 11. The moving of the Holy See of the Roman Catholic Church from Rome to Babylon. I believe that this will happen in Zechariah 5, 1, 1 through 5. The world church and the false prophet. Uh, <clears throat> the world economy will most likely be moved up very close to the tribulation. The world government will be in place. The government breaking into 10 pieces. I mean, this is Daniel 7:23. And the world government breaking into 10 division, Daniel 7, 24. And then the Antichrist is revealed. And we got 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. And Tommy tries to make this the rapture. Instead, I believe that he's saying, what we're saying here is that concerning the coming of the soon coming of the Lord and our gathering together with him, that day will not come. In other words, the rapture will not come until the rapture comes. And then he uses the whole idea that the Antichrist is revealed. Well, the Antichrist isn't going to be revealed until after the world government breaks into ten divisions. So he would take us out before the Antichrist is revealed. Then what's the sign? The sign is you're, you're gone. And what happened was these Thessalonians were concerned a little bit about the fact that they may have missed the rapture if they were pre-trib. And so there were, and it kind of reminds me of these two dinosaurs that are having the, this deep theological discussion and all of a sudden, they see Noah's Ark floating by. And one of them says to the other, was that today? <laughs> and I think that's what the Thessalonians were thinking, you know. Did we miss it? If they were pre-tribs, that, that was a definite problem because that meant that they, they didn't get raptured. That meant that, uh, that uh, they, they, they didn't get saved. They weren't saved. And now, if they're post-tribs, then it would be something probably to rejoice in because they could have said, wow, we only got seven, seven years to wait and the Lord is coming back. But I do believe that that whole idea is the idea that this is what has been the historic view. And I think the reason why I can say that is the definition of the word. The Greek word language uses the word caught up is harpazo. Literally means to seize, to carry off. And Latin word was similar to the word rapture. That's why we call it rapture. But the premier verse concerning the doctrine of the rapture, of course, is 1 Thessalonians 4, written to the church to whom Paul said, you know, you received, that you were told when we were with you that you would suffer tribulation. The believers in Thessalonica were undergoing significant persecution at the hands of both Jews and Gentile antagonists. Paul wrote them because they had concern for their faith, lest their labor was in vain. He was giving them hope for things to come. Yes, but it's interesting to me, and I thought about this last night, the word harpazo, we were talking to a guy in Greece and asked a question, what does the word harpazo mean? This is his native language, and there was a salt shaker sitting in the middle of the table, and he snatched it up. That's what it means. And yet you look at the part, this, the passage in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, and it uses the word apostasia. Now, apostasia is the idea of turning away defection, apostasy, revolt. It's something you do as opposed to something that is done to you. The rapture, harpazo, is something that's done to you. Apostasy is something you do. You turn away from the truth. You turn away from God's revelation. And that's why most translators over the last 500 years have called it a falling away. 
of falling away from the truth. And as Tommy knows better than probably anybody else, we are living in a day of apostasy in almost every area. I, co I constantly run into new areas of apostasy. People kept coming to me and talk about the church at Bethel, you know, and these people are getting into some crazy stuff, uh, portals where they're traveling from one place to the next, supposedly, in physical bodies. They're talking about angel feathers falling on him while he's preaching. Angels don't have feathers. They're talking about gold dust and all kinds of crazy things. Contemplative prayer, soaking prayer, all of these things. And it's very similar to what I believe this uh, fellow was, he was angry at God. So he started writing a letter to God. And in the middle of his letter, God answered him. And all of a sudden, we have all of these answers, crazy things, answering God is speaking to him over the next 12 years or so. He continued to write answers from God. And this began a whole chain of letters, supposedly like uh, <clears throat> the uh, Helen Schuchman wrote um, the uh, book describing she channeled Jesus. She was a Jewish lady, an unconverted lady, but somehow she managed to channel Jesus in a course of miracles. And then we have uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard writing the book of Revelation, God channeling this material to her. So we've gotten people channeling stuff. Now we've got God calling and now Jesus calling. I mean, the church is going away. This is the, the, the church that we believe. This is an apostasy, and it's happening very rapidly. So I believe that that is not a rapture. It is a falling away from the truth. I'll stop there. Okay. Okay, thank you. You have, uh, what, three minutes to respond, Tom? Yes. I mean, I, I'm amazed. Uh, I can't even tell if you actually believe in a preacher of rapture. I was told you did. Uh, but you're relating all of these events that need to happen before the second coming, not the rapture. And when you uh, look at the fact that the tribulation is seven years plus could be days, weeks, months, or year interval, uh, Frichtenbaum thinks it was, it's going to be at least three and a half. Uh, Clarence Larkin, a hundred years ago, believed it would be 50 years for what it's worth uh, between, uh, of that interval between that. And that would enable all of these things to happen that you say uh, have to happen before the rapture. But none of them are stated that. Also, you have never said other than uh, just a general statement about it means that it's certain uh, to happen or something like that, uh, what these passages do mean. And uh, so many of these things that you say do not uh, relate to the rapture. And you have to understand that the rapture is a whole different program that was revealed starting with Christ in the Upper Room Discourse and then further revealed by the apostles. In the Upper Room Discourse, everything that he talks about was a brand new church age truth that he introduces. And he said three times in the Upper Room Discourse, I have more to tell you now, but you're not able to bear it. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all things. In other words, the further revelation and expansion of the epistles. And Paul is said to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was raptured to heaven in Second. According to 2 Corinthians 12, uh, it mentions that word twice, harpazo. Uh, and he said that's probably where he received the gospel because he said he didn't receive it from the apostles, etc. He received revelation relating to the uh, new, uh, God's plan for the church that hadn't been revealed at all in the Old Testament or in the Olivet Discourse or any of Christ's ministry up to uh, the, uh, the, that point. And so... You know, I, I just think that you're confusing some, many of these passages in a way that doesn't make sense. When you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, my thing's not up. Okay, there it is. He said, he opens the section by saying, Now I request your brethren with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. See, he's talking about the rapture, episunogoge. There are multiple terms that are used to describe the rapture. And then he says, uh, unless, for it, it, referring back to the day of the Lord, the which is the tribulation period, will not come unless the apostasy or departure comes first. And you said that 
that the, that the key meaning is is uh, revolt or something. No, the key meaning is departure. That's its lim lemon uh, or its uh, what we call lexical meaning. That's its core meaning. And here are the translations. The Vulgate translated departure. Uh, Wycliffe, all these early translations translated departure until the Reims Bible, the Catholic Bible, in 1582 wanted it to refer to a revolt by the Protestants. So they translated it revolt because they gave a theological interpretation. The core meaning of the word means departure. Is it and therefore, it has no object to direct object, like the only other use of this noun in the New Testament is in Acts 21:21, 21, 21, where it says Paul was accused of teaching them to depart from the Mosaic Law. There, it has an object, so you know what it, they're departing from. But here, it doesn't have an object; simply the departure with an article, which very likely means it refers to an event. And so you have all of these, and the Reims Bible did it, and even the Geneva Bible translated departing. And therefore, you have to figure out from the context what he's referring to. In the context, he's referring to the coming again and taking, you know, our, uh, gathering together to him, which would be a departure. And uh, so if it's a physical thing, it's a, it means disappearance, according to Liddell and Scott. And if it's a um, con conceptual thing, then it, it, it would be something like apostasy. But the King James countered in 1611 the Catholics with uh, departing. So they believed that the Catholic Church had departed and that another theological interpretation and that's how they changed the uh, uh, translation tradition and everything. So apostasy relates, well, that's it. Okay, He's got three minutes. Still, you can depart from the truth. I have no problem with your definition of that word, but it's you that's departing. You're not caught up by some other force like you are with uh, the actual rapture itself that he uses in First Thessalonians, and if he meant that for the Second Thessalonians, he should have used the same word. But he didn't, and the reason he didn't because I believe that the apostasy is something that everybody talks about. You had a seminar two years ago on the apostasy. I felt it was the best one you guys have ever done. But it was built on the whole idea that the apostasy is a departure from the truth, and that's what's happening in the world today. That's what we see. And then we also expect to see the man of sin. If he didn't believe that the man of sin was going to be revealed, who was it going to be revealed to if we already left? Why even throw it in the verse? So the man of sin will be revealed, but it'll only happen after the one world government that breaks into ten pieces. So there's a lot of things that have to happen, and that one world government will not be established until the Battle of Gog and Magog. We have to get rid of the Jewish, the Islamic presence in order to build a temple, and the temple has to be pretty much in place before the start of the tribulation. So in order, the, the whole, all of prophecy is up against Islam right now. It can't go any further. We can't have a one world government unless it's Islamic. We can't have almost anything until the Islamic presence is removed with the Battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is imminent, could happen at any moment, takes place. Then the one world church, the, 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 the false prophet, can come in and we will see the rest of these prophecies being fulfilled. Okay, thank you, uh, David. And uh, now it's time for cross-examinations. And uh, Dave, you have... Uh, Eight minutes to cross-examine Tommy. Tommy, I asked you a question, and I don't remember you answering it, and it had to do with how you interpret, let's see, where I, yeah, how you interpret peace and safety of 1 Thessalonians 5.3. How did that peace and safety come about? Uh, I did allude to it, plus I'm not going to waste my time when I'm, answering you uh, dealing with the question. It saved it for this time uh, oh. when we answer questions during the interrogation period. But oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm I, I believe it refers to uh, unbelievers. What peace and safety of unbelievers? The Thessalonians. Yeah, it says when they are saying peace and safety. Now, we don't know whether they yeah, have peace true. and safety and they are... 
wanting it or they don't have peace and safety. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, they don't, they, or they do have peace and safety. No, they don't have peace and safety and they want it or they do have peace and safety. And I think it refers to the believer here. When, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. Okay, what time is that happening? It happens during, probably during the seven-year process of the tribulation. Well, it's before. It says, uh, it says, you know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When they say peace, and so it looks like it's the coming of the day of the Lord, which is the tribulation. So it looks like it's going to happen before the tribulation. And as I said, you have a similar statement over here in Revelation. Let me look at it. Uh, Revelation 16, right in the middle of judgment. Uh, Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. And so the, the earth dwellers, which are unbelievers in the book of Revelation, uh, and we, I think those are earth dwellers there in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, three, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, they are the ones that are always going to be overtaken by uh, the events of God's direct intervention in history, not believers. So you don't think it's a time of peace and safety is what you're saying. You just say they're, they're hoping for peace and safety. Why does it even say peace and safety? If it's not really an event that's happening, you know, I, I'm not sure I understand what you yeah. mean. Yeah, well, take it either way. It doesn't matter to my view. Uh, there is not a time in history that I can remember from the time of the creation until now that we've really had peace and safety in the world. There's only one time that I can think of that we might be having peace and safety, and that would be when the Antichrist finally comes and he brings this, the white horse, the first seal, and there's probably some, when he's getting people to sign the covenant, and of course, all of a sudden, the Jewish people are thinking about the overflowing scourge. Okay, we don't have to worry about that anymore. So there may be a time of peace and safety just before the rapture, because that's what the time it's saying right in here, that the Antichrist has revealed, we know who he is, there's going to be a time, he hasn't signed the covenant yet, that would be the time, beginning of the tribulation. Yes, I am a pre-tribulationist, but I'm saying that there is some things that have to happen before the tribulation that, that still we have to, and I, there, is a, there is something I believe that we need to understand. If I believed that the Lord was coming back any moment, I'd have a tendency to go watch Hallmark movies for the next you know, 15, 20 minutes while I'm waiting for the Lord to come. But if I know he's coming as a little ways off now, I can go get another degree, I can write some more books, I can talk, I can you know, do debates, I can do more things. I know I've got some time to do stuff. So I don't know that the eminence idea is something that would bring people to do more righteousness than knowing you've got time to do something for the Lord, and I'm going to use that time. So I think there's, there's that aspect. I just kind of throw that in. But you say that that day of peace and safety, what, when is this happening? I, I, I'm not for sure, but it, it's the unbeliever who's always caught off guard by God's intervention in history. That's true. And therefore, I think it's referring to unbelievers. It's not referring to believers. Right. Plus, if you want to have a non-Christian view I would agree of, with that. of imminence, that's fine. The Bible says that Christians and believers are motivated to godly living by the fact that Christ can come at any moment. He who has his hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Even Satan during the tribulation he knows he only has a short while, and he doesn't go to Miami Beach and kick back. He uh, is motivated, you know, to do stuff, to try to take as many innocent people with him as he can. So uh, that's not the logic. He that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Yeah, we all have the hope because we're Christians. That's a Christian term. We all hope of his coming, so we know that Christ is coming to judge us. And so, yes, that alone would be enough motivation for us to want to be live pure lives but the eminent idea is what I say that if it's coming like immediately that there's not much time for me to do anything so if I really believed in that eminence, that's not the eminent view the yeah. eminent view is that you want me to put it back up here again yeah I understand so, what you so mean. you can see it it's that he could come at any moment yeah not that he will 
he yeah. could. Right. And you're assuming he will. No, I'm just saying if or I, that I, it's going to take a long time. No, in, in what you're saying, that's what you're assuming. Right. And that's not what we who believe in eminence believe. Yeah, I realize that. Go ahead. Well, you're you're the one interrogating. <laughs> I say if if I believe that it would happen at any moment, it would not motivate me to do a lot of things if I knew if I really believed it but if I believe that I had some time and it, because I know it's not imminent there are time that I can really start to do things that may take longer well I know you know I was involved in the Jesus movement in the early 70s and that was the big motivation for people coming to Christ yeah. they were afraid they would be uh, wouldn't be taken in the rapture I mean historically that's not the case the early church believed in eminence uh, check out the historians on that. And uh, they were pretty active. None of the church, early church, believed in eminence. They all believed in the post-trib view. They did, but they believed in eminence. They believed in both. That's why I'm saying it, uh, because they tended to believe that the, the, that the church age was the tribulation that they were living in. It's called intra-tribulationalism, if you want a scholarly term. But they also believe in eminence. Almost all of the uh, historians say that very strongly, and it died, began to die out in the second century as they began to settle down into this world. They did believe that they were in the middle of tribulation, that is true, but they also were post-trib, so they believed yes. that Jesus was coming. I, no debate there. Tommy, you have eight minutes to cross-examine uh, Dave. I don't think I understood what cross-examination was, so... Yeah. You ever seen Perry Mason? <laughs> uh, the, your, your points about the Son of Man in 2 Thessalonians 3 have, have nothing to do with it. They're not told to look for a sign. Instead, uh, they, they, the, they believed that they were in the day of the Lord, which is a tribulation. And he's telling them two reasons why they're not in the day of the Lord. The apostasia has not occurred, whatever that means. And secondly, the man of loss has not been revealed. Right. Uh, we're not saying the man, you know, so if, it's, if pre-tribulationalism is true, this is not a problem for us. Even if you don't take my view of apostasy or referring to uh, the rapture, it simply means uh, that he's giving two reasons why they are not in the day of the Lord or the tribulation. And uh, he talks in verse 15 about how he had written to them earlier. And uh, therefore, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, these were not signs. You kept characterizing them as signs that they were to see before the rapture, but that's not our position. Well, uh, so how would you handle verses like the ones that talk about uh, waiting for his son from heaven and all of this kind of stuff? Are, the, are we not to wait for the Lord from heaven? In a way that you are waiting, you are anxiously waiting for his coming, knowing that it's not going to be coming anywhere soon, but you can still be anxious for his coming. Um, the wait upon the Lord, Joel, to renew his strength, you know, the whole idea of um, Isaiah 58, this idea is something that we all have that hope within us. So could you show me a passage where you don't have to import it from Isaiah or some other verse uh, that says what you said? A waiting passage? I'll almost. These are all absolute statements. Waiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Waiting, wait for a Savior, the Lord. There are no uh, conditional you know, sub-clauses attached to this. Well, we know, as I've said before, we know that, though, that he did not mean that it would be imminent or immediate because it didn't happen. 
That was one reason. Yeah, but that see, once again, you're not using the imminent term, uh, the term imminent in the way that we use it. And there you're, were things you're that You're using happened. it differently and saying that we don't live up to your different view of imminence. So you cannot produce a passage that talks about waiting for Christ from heaven that has any of these uh, qualifications that you've added? Well, any, one, any passage that I used all the way through the New Testament, I used one passage after another, which basically doesn't teach eminence. James would be one good one. We know that James did not mean that he was, you know, he says that uh, it would be translated near or nigh. In case. Yeah. Have no problem there. But it's, it's the rest of the sentence that where he talks about uh, he's standing right at the door. You didn't even deal with that imagery there, with that uh, metaphor. Wouldn't that metaphor mean that's the next event? Well, Jesus couldn't return because James wrote his letter in 36 A.D. The temple had not 36? been destroyed. 36? I've never heard anybody put it 36. Yeah, it, it could be later, but some people think. Okay. But... And I said that because the temple had not been destroyed. Jesus had promised that the temple would be destroyed. James did not, you know, he did not teach the doctrine of eminence. There were so many things that have to happen. None of these people were teaching the doctrine of eminence. None of the New Testament writers were teaching eminence. Well, you keep saying that, but you haven't pointed to a passage that relates to the rapture. You pointed to all kinds of passages that, that relate to the second coming. They all lead to the rapture. Do you believe in the preacher of rapture? Yes. On what basis? Well, I certainly don't use eminence. I know. I ask <laughs> what basis. I think the reason that you hold to eminence is because that's the only thing that you've got to hold to to believe in pre-tribulationism. I'm not saying you necessarily, but I think a lot of people do that. And I think that is really not necessary, and it's not true. I mean, there's so many passages that you could use to show the pre-trib rapture okay. without could eminence. Okay, could you list one? Uh well, I like uh, Revelation 3.10. Okay. You know. Kept from the kept time. Kept from the hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, but the point is, is these passages, you haven't shown that they don't mean imminence. Uh, you've, sa you've said that. You've stated that. But you haven't demonstrated from the context. Look, you're seminary trained. We have a similar training and you know that you have to show what a passage means in its context before you right. go trotting off to other passages. I mean, I proper exegesis is, you know, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. No qualifiers there. But the end of all things is at hand, okay? Obviously, he didn't mean that it was going to happen anywhere anytime soon. Right, but our view with the gap between the rapture and the start of the tribulation and the tribulation itself where most of those I, things you brought up will, be, uh, will occur. Uh, for example, I put Gog and Magog between the rapture and the start of the tribulation. And you said all these things have to happen. Well, they, they don't have to happen for the rapture to occur, but they have to happen for the second coming to occur. Well, they have to happen before the rapture, and you and I agree on that. In fact, you and no, I are they don't. probably... I don't think anything has to happen before the rapture. Maybe it'll happen right here at the end of this thing. There are at least five reasons why the Battle of Gog and Magog has to occur before the rapture. Boy, that's news to me. <laughs> well, so you, you hold to that it does. No, I don't. I okay. do not hold that it does. Well, you're going to have to burn the weapons for seven years. Right. You're That's why we have an interval of at least three and a half years between. So it happens after the rapture, but before the tribulation begins. So you can have, say, a seven and a half year period or four year period between the rapture and uh, the midpoint of, of the, the tribulation, tribulation the which would be seven flee to and Petra or wherever. Yeah. So it doesn't have but to happen before you, the rapture. You can't have a gap because of Luke 17. No. They're eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. That's life is normal. Right? I take that to refer the to the day events. that Lot fled, fled from Sodom. The very day. I take that from. to refer to the tribulation period, not relating to the rapture. None of those Olivet Discourse or 
things relate to the rapture. The only gospel passage is John 14, 1 through 3. Well, if it's not the rapture, then... It's a second coming. Events, the conditions... It can't be the second coming because they're not, life is not normal during the tribulation. They're not going to be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and building and planning. That's not what's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. They're going to be hanging on for dear life. That metaphor is not talking about their life being normal. That metaphor is talking about how abnormal things are happening, as you described, but they're trying to treat it like nothing is happening, just like they did at the flood. That's what that metaphor is. There is describes. a lot of things, a lot of evil that was happening before the flood. That's right. why God joined him. There was a lot of evil happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. That is true. But it wasn't God's judgment upon them yet, and it wasn't until God judged them with the flood. That was the tribulation, because he's talking about his coming, and he's coming when everything is normal. Yeah. It's not going to be normal during the tribulation. Well, okay, but that I don't agree with that. And my view can handle all of these objections that you've raised. Plus, we have the any moment possibility here. And you have not been able to point to a passage where it says to wait for his son from heaven or any of those passages I presented as eminence passages that talk about this. Give me a passage. Well, I've got them up. I mean, uh, I gave you, what, eight, nine passages, 1 Peter 1.13, or Jude 21, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Good, good uh, debate, but now we have questions from the audience. Hopefully, uh, you've been stimulated enough to come up with some, some questions, or this is just so overwhelming you don't know what to ask. <laughs> so I'm going to use this mic. So we can we can get this on. Hope I don't get f feedback testing. This on. Um, uh, okay. The way I was taught is that the the rapture was the okay. You have the pro you have the prophecies of everything that's going to happen during the tribulation before the second coming. But as for the rapture, we had no other prophecies left. I mean, it was like nothing had to happen before the rapture. And then after the rapture, we had all the other things that had to happen. And that seems to fit in scripture where you have all these signs of the second coming, but you don't have any signs of the rapture. Uh, it's like the rapture could happen any minute but we know that Jesus isn't going to come back bodily until, you know, you have the Antichrist and everything. So it's like we have both sides. We have one, all these signs, and then on the other, we don't have any signs. Uh, do you agree with that? Does that seem to fit? Who's you? Who? Tommy first and then Dave. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I do. That's what I've been saying. There are, there's nothing that has to transpire for the rapture to take place. Well, every single one of these is before the day of the Lord. Now Tommy puts a gap in there, which is a catch-all, because he can throw all of these things into that gap, which can't exist because of Luke 17. But he puts that gap in there, which gets him out of the hook. But, in, for example, in uh, uh, Malachi 4.5, that Elijah will come just before the day of the Lord the day of the Lord being defined as the tribulation. Every single one of these passages that has to happen has to happen before the tribulation. The difference is Tommy has a gap so he can get away with putting all of that stuff between the rapture and the tribulation, and the only reason he does that is so he can hold on to eminence. Well, actually, I came to a lot of these views without eminence in mind, but nevertheless, great and terrible day of the Lord is used in Malachi. In Joel, it's great and terrible day of the Lord. That means the second coming, not the day of the Lord. So Elijah must come sometime before the second coming. That's the only two times great and terrible day of the Lord are used. And it's used by Jesus in the context of Joel passage, great and terrible day of the Lord, of his second coming. You know, so I, I'll go with Jesus on that one. 
All right, mine, uh, mine pertains to uh, John 14, 1 through 3, uh, because when Jesus is talking about, you know, I go and prepare a place, and where I am, you will be, or where I am, you will be with me and receive you to, to myself. Okay, so what does that mean if the second coming, he's coming and is going to be on the earth? So that would, to me, mean that we're going to be taken away and be with him before the tribulation starts, right? Yes. He, he's going to heaven, and he's going to take us to heaven. And that's what Paul says. He's going to take us to be with him. In fact, you have that passage there in John 14, uh, 1 through 3, where Jesus talks about it. And, uh, yeah, he says, and I, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. I, I like the, this is lambano, another word. If this is referring to the rapture, it's a different word than harpazo, by the way. It means to take. It's the very same word that was used in Hebrews of Enoch, who was not, for he was taken, you know. And uh, I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Now, when you go to, um, you see this progression here that we have in a lot of my literature of the same exact progression between the eight thoughts of John 14, 1 through 3, and a parallel of those eight thoughts in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Now, now I would assume that David believes these refer to the rapture, but uh, there are a lot of people that don't, but this helps us to see uh, structurally that he's talking about the same event there. <coughs> and whereas the second coming, that's why I had those two graphics that were different, qualitatively refers to uh, the church, by the way, in the first part of chapter 19, who has made herself ready and she returns with Christ. So she's already in heaven, uh, experienced the beam of judgment, the white robes or righteous acts of the saints, and she returns with Christ because wherever he goes, we're going to go. We're his bride. And I would agree with you on the Paralambano. That's the idea of take along with now, the reason why some people think it's judgment is because they took Jesus, Paralambano, into judgment. But it has nothing to do with where they're taking him. It's the idea of taking him along with, as you say. And that's the idea that these people are being taken along with Jesus. In Luke 17, they're taking to the rapture. And the word ephemi is the word left behind. It's always a negative term. It's basically referring to those who are like a father deserting his family or something negatively. So here we would think that that passage in Luke 17 is talking about the rapture. Yeah, and it depends on how it's used in a context. Con when I was in seminary, we had the hermeneutical cheer. Context, context, context. <laughs> and people create problems, interpretive problems, by taking scriptures out of context and bringing thoughts into it that aren't in the passage itself. And, and therefore, they mix and blend and come up with all kinds of things a lot of times. You have to discipline yourself to understand what that passage means. And so there are multiple terms used for the rapture, I think, including gathering ourselves together to him. The, the idea him. of unexpectedness would always have to do with the rapture because if it was a revelation, it was the final coming of Jesus Christ, they could count days. Right. Exactly. Uh, thank you, guys. I really appreciate this uh, debate. It's very interesting. Um, Matthew 25, no one spoke on that so far that I know of. Maybe I was sleeping. But this is where I don't really do So you're it. the one snoring, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, My that was me. My wife sitting right behind me. Maybe it was her. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you'll be sleeping tonight. <laughs> okay, Matthew 25 is where Jesus was. Yeah, <laughs> Matthew 25 is where Jesus was speaking uh, with the parable of the ten virgins. We had four, the five foolish virgins, five wise virgins. Uh, it was certainly regarding the imminency of the return of the bridegroom. Uh, whether or not you apply that to Israel only or whether you're applying that to the church or to both, um, he ends it with, watch therefore, uh, for you do not know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. 
it gives two suggestions here. One, we don't know, but two, to watch with understanding that the bridegroom is coming soon. So I'd like you to address that. And then one other thing kind of tied to this, if you would, could either of you uh, just give your viewpoint on how eminency or not believing in the imminent return of Christ uh, is harmful to the believer? Yeah, I, I would argue that you, Jesus has his basic discourse in 20, uh, dealing with Matthew's version uh, in 24, 4 through 31. And then it's followed by a series of parables. So when it's talking about coming, what coming is he talking about? Something he hasn't introduced yet? No, he's talking about the second coming. So this is about how Israel was not watchful. And he uses the uh, Jewish wedding motif as an illustration in this particular context. And I, I think if you don't believe in imminency, then you're probably not going to believe in the preacher of rapture. And that's bad. I'm not even sure what the question was, but <laughs> I believe that 31 is actually, he sent his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. Now, I know that Tommy doesn't agree with this, but I believe that that elect is not only the Jews, but it's those believers, first of all, the Old Testament saints, then the tribulation saints that have been martyred, the tribulation saints that have been resurrected, they're all going to be raptured at the end of the tribulation. So we got three raptures. We got the beginning of the tribulation, the rapture before the tribulation, the two witnesses in the middle of the tribulation, and then a rapture at the end of the tribulation. And then we have, and, and I believe that book of Revelation 6 through 19, the church is not mentioned, so the church is not in the tribulation, just tribulation saints. And then chapter 19, you have a picture of the, the wedding feast. So now you have the church is mentioned again. But who's going to participate in the wedding feast? You're going to have the church, the bride of Christ. Then you're going to have the Old Testament saints, friend of the bride. Then you're going to have the tribulation saints, also friends of the bride, and those that have been raptured. So who's going to go on to, to uh, populate the millennial kingdom? We've got two groups. Yeah, those who survive, who are saved after the rapture uh, and survive it physically will go into, you know, it says it in Matthew 13, enter into my kingdom, or it's in Matthew 25, the sheep goat judgments, enter into my kingdom. Right, the sheep goat judgment, and I believe that is those, but there's two groups. There is the Jews. He said, I will not return until they seek my face. This is Hosea 5, 14 through 6, 2. Right. And so they call upon him from Petra. Jesus comes back. We've already had the marriage feast of the lamb. We've had the no, the, the marriage of the lamb, not the feast. The marriage of the lamb. Yep. And we've also had, I believe, the marriage feast of the lamb. Wow. I know you put that in the tribute in the millennium. But then we also have the, the group coming down. They've got their Bema seat judgment, the uh, first second Corinthians five ten. They come down with their rewards and they rescue. Jesus comes straight to Petra. Where does Jesus where does God come from? God from, comes from Petra. Petra was part of Eden, which include Petra. And uh, God comes from Teman, I'm sorry, and Teman is that whole area of Edom. And so he comes there to rescue the Jews. The Antichrist has sent his army to destroy the Jews. The Jews cry out to God, and God comes to rescue them, and they march towards Jerusalem. Jesus sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives. It splits in two. There is this battle of Armageddon. So we have a battle of Gog and Magog before the tribulation. We have the battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation, and that's two different battles. There's one that they're destroyed by fire, the other one there's blood up to the horse's bridles. There's a lot of other differences between the two. There's a bunch of birds over there, actually. The Jews are now uh, <laughs> taking, they've got all these sanctuaries for all these vultures and various things, so they're getting ready for this feast. They're mainly hooping cranes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so yeah, yes, basically that whole picture, yeah, but I'll what I'm seeing... Valley. Isn't this interesting that we, we can deal with the details of of Bible prophecy because we hold a premillennial view. Our millennials can't have any fun with Bible prophecy. They, you know, the only thing that they can say is that good is going to triumph over evil. Jesus is going to win in the end. They, they can't have any fun with Bible prophecy like we can. Like, go ahead. Um, 
Okay, so I know that God understands exactly what has to happen before the rapture comes. Um, and whatever right. those things may be that still have to happen first, I'm just wondering why does that affect um, our view on imminency? Because um, those things can happen as quickly as God wants them to. And it could even happen before we even hear the news of it. And therefore, even if, even if these things have to happen first, it doesn't necessarily mean it is going to be a long time. And therefore, from our perspective, shouldn't we still consider it imminent? No. <laughs> no, you're going to have to have at least three and a half years before the rapture if you're going to burn the weapons for seven years and there is no gap. Because Not you have before to... the rapture. Yeah. But... After the rapture. Well, because the, you can't put a gap in there. So because you can't put a gap, then you have to, <laughs> then you have to start with the Battle of Gog and Magog at least three and a half years before the tribulation starts. Well, which I'm, would... I'm just saying all, virtually everybody in the pre-trib world does put a gap in there. And you'll say it's because we have to have eminence. But let me just say this. The, we derive that from Second Thessalonians where you have the fact that the man of sin is being restrained. We believe probably both by the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Did you go with Frickenbaum or Michael the Archangel or what? No, he uh, is being restrained by uh, there's, there's a masculine and a neuter. Right. And so you can't have either the Holy Spirit or the church be that position, so it has to be the king and the country itself that's restraining the, restraining well, the, the Antichrist. The reason you have a masculine and a neuter is the word pneuma, spirit, is normally neuter, and then he switches to the uh, masculine because he's referring to a person, uh, which is the Holy Spirit, besides only God can restrain. But beside of that, I want to make this other point, and that is that... Uh, if the, if the Antichrist is being restrained until the church is removed, the Holy Spirit's indwelling ministry of the church, thus the church is removed, the Holy Spirit's ministries will still be around to help people get saved and all that. It's a reversal of Pentecost. The uh, indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit that began the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, there has to be a time period for the Antichrist based on Daniel to... Uh, the ten nations, when you read the book of Daniel, at first, in Daniel chapter 7, you have the ten-nation confederacy arise, and then the little horn comes up. Right. And he then has to persuade seven of those nations to follow him, and three nations he t overtakes right. militarily, and then he forms that, you, you know, the revived Roman Empire. And then he makes the covenant with Israel. So you cannot have the rapture happen on day one and then the very next day the tribulation starts because these take time. And there's other events, we believe, that have to happen during that interval. So there has to be an interval. And it's, it's deduced from Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a stage setter, by the way. What See, is the stage center? Well, these things gathering, he doesn't have, the rapture doesn't have to happen right at that time. He, he is gathering these nations. That's before the tribulation, before the rapture. Yeah, but the, the, the rapture ends the restrainer, whoever he is. The restrainer. And then the, uh, otherwise, the man of lawless would have already come, most likely, if he's not being restrained. There is a problem with who's going to be witnessing where that message is going to come from if the Christians are gone and the Holy Spirit is gone. At the beginning of the tribulation, you've got 144,000 witnesses. You've got the angel going throughout preaching the gospel. You've got the Christians who get saved. So you've got the gospel preached during the tribulation. You don't have any during that gap. Well, you've got all the left behind books left behind and the left behind Yeah, movie. your books. <laughs> And if the rapture occurs, watch this video type stuff. I mean, goodness. And I, I think when the rapture occurs, there's going to be a lot of people on the fence. And, you know, spouses that have lived with their spouse for years and their crazy spouse has said, you know, the rapture is going to occur and it happens. And, you know, children and friends and all. And the right people are missing or the wrong people, you know. 
I, I think a lot of people are going to start getting saved even before the tribulation begins. But you're right. In the first half of the tribulation is a big harvest uh, globally by the 144,000. Okay. Uh, I th I'm going to say I think most of the people in here have their own kind of feel for or imp interpretation of what the word imminence means to them. For example, to me it means next few days or maybe the next 15 months. You know, that's kind of my feel for what imminence means. So in that respect, how would each one of you describe what your feel for the word imminence means? Well, if I might be so bold as to say, it really doesn't matter what everybody thinks. Uh, it matters whether or not uh, what I'm saying or anybody who believes in this view as defined by the dictionary, uh, you know, is, is that we've correctly analyzed these passages and stated that Christ could come at any moment. And a person may feel one way or the other about that, and that's not the issue. It's have we correctly handled the word of God on this issue? You can't have eminence if you have certain things that have to happen before the event. That's right. And what I'm saying is that there's about 16 things that have to happen before the rapture takes place. And I don't believe that there's any possibility that you could have a gap. Well, see, you just hold that view that there's no gap because you don't want a gap. If you accuse me of just seeing things because of No, eminence, because Luke 17 doesn't allow you to have it. It says on the very day that Noah entered the ark, on the very day that Lot fled from Sodom, judgment came. Yeah, and, and, and he's using that to illustrate his first coming. Yeah, you don't take every little aspect. It's what they're talking about. The big idea there is that uh, they were eating, uh, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. They're going about their normal lives. They're attempting to when, with impending judgment. And it is true, the very, actually, when Noah went into the ark, according to Genesis, it was a seven-day period. No, that, the day that he entered the ark, that was when judgment came. I well, know that some people Genesis, mis misinterpret that, but... Genesis, read Genesis 6. You know, it says that there was a seven-day period. And therefore, it must mean in the day, in other words, the time period, that Noah went into the ark... But it says, I, ju I just did this chart book. Yeah. And uh, I've dealt we, with that passage. We have all of these uh, passages that we charted out here. Let's see. I think it's chapter 7. Okay. Went into the ark. After seven more days, I will send rain on the earth. Forty days and forty nights. So he went into the ark, and after seven days, the Lord sent rain. And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. He was walking through the flood when he got there. Maybe you're watching that movie that they came out a couple of years ago. No, I'm reading the scriptures. <laughs> but, uh, and after seven more days, I will send the rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Yes, but he didn't go in until verse 7. Uh, this is this is mainly for Dave. Um, my impression of the apostasy, and I may be wrong on that, but my impression always has been that uh, the Antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies, claims he's God, and the professing church of that point in time says 
yes, you are. You're the second coming of Christ. And they're wrong. You know, and so doesn't even the apostasy spoken of there have to be one event? You well, know, first of as all, the opposed church is not to all there. the other apostasies that occurred down through history, starting with Judas Iscariot and, and others. And this is mainly for Dave, but I'd like to hear your comment too, Tommy. For him? It's mainly for Dave, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so you're, you're saying that the, the main apostasy is... I'm saying that if you interpret the apostasy as departing from the faith... Doesn't that have to be a certain specific departure from the faith? Yeah, it's got the article. Rather than a general uh, uh, departure from the faith, because Judas Iscariot departed from the faith, and, and Paul spoke about when he was going back to Jerusalem that people there at Ephesus or wherever it was uh, were going to depart from the faith, and that was first century people. And it, you know, I'm th and then there's been departures from the faith ever since. So I'm just wondering if that's got to be an event itself, and it's got to be assuming that uh, or agreeing with the Antichrist that he's God. That would be a huge departure. There is a definite article there, and it does mean something specific. But it does it. The apostasy has never been what it is today, and what it's becoming. Can I have my PowerPoint? Yes, sir, please. Can I have the PowerPoint on? Uh, actually, I have Keynote, but uh, there you go. These are the major end-time apostasy passages, and I forgot to point out that the verb apostasy is used 15 times. That's the same form that the noun comes from the same root, cognate verb we call it. And it is used 15 times, and 11 of the 15 times it refers to physical departure, of physically departing from, like, the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, for example. But uh, the verb is used, like in 1 Timothy 4.1, in the last days, you know, men will depart from the faith. There it's used abstractly. And here are the seven main apostasy passages. And this is one of the major themes in the New Testament. However... I don't think that's what it's referring to. You have to, if you take it to refer to the apostasy or the falling away, as the King James translated, then there are all kinds of views of what that refers to. There's certainly no consensus. And as he was saying, doesn't it have to be some event that happens during the tribulation if you take it that way? Well, most people who take it that way say it refers to the end-time apostasy of the church. But on what basis? There's really nothing in the passage that says that unless you're referring to the tr some falling away uh, during the tribulation, which the church is not even there during that time. Uh, if, if you believe in a pre-trib rapture, well, even if you don't, you're going to go up kicking and screaming. But nevertheless, uh, it's going to happen. Remember Larry Norman had a song, even if you don't believe it's going to come true, even if you don't believe it's going to happen to you, he's going to come down, take a last look around with both feet off the ground, we'll all be homeward bound. Amen. Even if you don't believe it's going to come true. But nevertheless, uh, so I believe strongly in apostasy is what I wanted to say. And um, it happened, as he said, or he said, <laughs> In the early church. That's why James, he wanted to write a nice, positive Bob Schuler epistle. You know, and, uh, but he couldn't, he had to write about the apostasy because that was more urgent. And it was happening in the first century. And that's another point that has been going on throughout the church. Get time for one more question before closing arguments. Okay, Adam. Thank you. Uh, this question is directed to Dr. Ice. Um, you referred to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and I, I believe you said your interpretation is that when it says departing, it's referring to the rapture of yes. the church. And it, it was my understanding that Paul was addressing the early church that thought that they were in the tribulation times. Right. Um, so he's, he's saying that you know, you're not in the tribulation times because the rapture hasn't happened. 
and the man of lawlessness, lawlessness has not been revealed. Right. Right. So wouldn't both those events have to happen? Wouldn't the man of lawlessness have to be revealed before the rapture would happen for them to know that they're not in the tribulation? No. Could you explain why that would be? Well, if, when you're, if they would know if they're raptured, right? Right. So they would know that they haven't experienced the rapture yet. Right. Or they have experienced rapture. And they would also know if the man of lawlessness has been revealed. Right. Right. So he's saying both of those events have to happen. Yeah. He says first the, the apostasia. And then he says the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Now, he's not saying that has to happen before the rapture. Some people misinterpreted that. He's saying reason number one, first, the rapture or the apostasy or whatever that is. In other words, these, he's listing reasons why they are not in the tribulation. And first, he said, that, you know, the apostasy has not occurred. And secondly, uh, the... Man, uh, man of lawlessness has not been revealed. But wouldn't it apply that imply that they would they would be on earth to see the man of lawlessness revealed if he's going to give them both of those conditions? I see what you're saying. No, but those would be reasons why, because they're still here, that the rapture has not occurred. And later in verse 15, he talks about how he had written to them previously about this. And there's nowhere in 1 Thessalonians about apostasy. But he certainly talks about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians. That's, I think that's another support. I think context, since you don't have an object. By the way, this passage has nothing to do with eminence. He brought it up, you know. Uh, it has nothing to do with eminence. It doesn't help or hurt eminence. But it is an argument made about the pre-trib rapture that some believe in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The idea, of course, is that you're holding fast to the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by epistles. He's not saying the things that I taught you necessarily. Well, he, it's hard for me to not say anything. <laughs> well, he says, first of all, the apostasy, second, the Antichrist. But before those two can come, the restrainer has to be removed. And so many believe that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit working through the church, which would be the rapture. Yeah, but that's a later argument. Yeah. I would like to uh, have each of you comment on Hebrews chapter 9, the last verse. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I think it refers to the second coming. I, I do too. So the rapture is. So it not, is the second time coming. That's and, my understanding at this and point. And that would be. At that the would end be of at the, the end of the seven year tribulation. Because the first time he came, he came on planet Earth. At the rapture, he does not come to planet Earth. He comes in the air. It's a coming. Yeah, but we go up to meet him. And we go back with him to the Father's house. Uh, but the second coming is when he returns and, as David was saying, puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. So I would take this to be the second coming, not the rapture. I would agree. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Lehman. Um, I think you mentioned up there something, and I don't remember the context exactly, but you mentioned... I believe Russia, Islam, and Egypt would be destroyed. Right. Okay. Uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 20, uh, or chapter 19, rather, in verses 24, in that day Israel will be one of three with Egypt, and Assyria a blessing uh, in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, 
and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance. So if God says, if God says that he's going to bless Egypt, my people, how does that fit into what you said? Uh, Egypt is going to be destroyed during the Battle of Gog and Magog. So is Russia, so are several other countries. Okay. So that will be the first battle just prior to the tribulation. And so a lot of these 16 prophecies are things that have to be fulfilled before the tribulation, which I would say would be before the rapture. Many of them are happening con concurrently. Damascus is destroyed, is, Egypt is destroyed, um, Russia and all of the countries that are helping Russia to attack Israel are being destroyed by fire, not only the armies but the countries themselves. So we remove the Islamic presence from the world. Now we can begin to see the rest of prophecy being fulfilled, the world church and the temple, everything else. Okay. I just found it interesting that uh, Egypt would be destroyed when God says they're my people. Well, uh, Egypt is not mentioned in the Battle of Gog and Magog, but it does say, it lists seven or eight nations and others with them, so they could. But this doesn't happen before the rapture. It happens after the rapture. And because it's associated with the tribulation, you look at Ezekiel 38, 39, it says, it talks about in Deuteronomy 30 about how God will turn his back on his people. And in Ezekiel 39, when this happens, the nation's going to become, know that he is the Lord and he's going to turn his face toward them again. So he's going to start dealing with them uh, during this time. And, uh, but I believe all of these are related to Armageddon. And you're going to have, you have in Ezekiel a passage that talks about how the Egyptians in the millennium, so there'll be saved Egyptians who make it into the millennium, they're going to be scattered, it says, around the nations for the, for the first 40 years, it says for 40 years, uh, because of the way they treated <coughs> Israel. And then they're going to be regathered at the end of this 40-year dispersion at the beginning of the millennium is my understanding, and they're going to be a base nation from that point on, a low nation. So you have, obviously, even though Egypt's going to be defeated, just like Germany was defeated, there were still Germans around, you know, it's probably going to be a similar situation. What we have is the Battle of Gog and Magog occurs from beginning of chapter 38 through 3916, and then we go to the Battle of Armageddon. So yes, both of them are included. Okay, time for closing uh, arguments. Tommy, uh, you've got five and a half, six minutes. Okay, yeah. I don't believe that David has shown that he can handle the passages I cited as passages relating to eminence. He declared that they would not support eminence, but he couldn't show from a single passage that I had put up that the context supports his notion. And, uh, you know, I think he failed uh, to do that, whereas uh, I think, on the other hand, those passages clearly imply, since they're waiting for Christ from heaven at any moment, uh, then uh, he then it teaches what we call that word we Latin term we use for imminence or any moment or what, whatever is a good term there. And uh, I also believe that over and over again he kept referring to things that were going to happen in the tribulation as if they have to happen before the rapture. It just makes no sense. And I think it's because he thinks the rapture is somehow mentioned in the Olivet Discourse. Now, I remember when I was uh, young I just read Hal Lindsey, good friend of mine, by the way. Helped him write one of his books later. Uh, you know, I believe the rapture was taught in the Olivet Discourse from those parables. And I believe the generation and all that kind of stuff. But as I studied the Bible more deeply, and I've discussed it with Hal, he, he is very dogmatic on that. He, he won't give up. He's, I think he's got a generation up to 120 years now. Uh, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, 
it's a more consistent understanding of what the passage means by what it says in its context is referring to the second coming because Christ had not yet introduced the church or the church age. And when you come to the eminency passage related to the rapture, there's never any judgment language associated with it, for example. It, it, only, it doesn't talk about unbelievers. It doesn't talk about judgment or any of this. It just talks about Christ coming and taking us to be with him. And that's why we're waiting for him. And this is why it's called in Titus 2.13, the blessed hope and appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's our focus. And so our, it's saying that we, we are not to put our our real hopes and desires in the things of this world. We obviously have to have things in this world in order to survive and do well, but he will provide them. But we are to have a heavenly focus with our right priorities because we're going to spend eternity at his right hand, at his side. And this was not revealed in the Old Testament. That's why it's called a mystery. And the bride will play an important role uh, in eternity as God has different people groups of saved people as part of his plan for history. And uh, so, as it says there in 1 John 3, he, he's talking about the blessed hope because he talks about how we, we should not sh shrink back at his appearing. Why would a believer shrink back at his appearing? because they're not living the way they should. And he says, he that has this hope, the appearing, his re the rapture, I think, uh, purifies himself even as he is pure. This is seen as not the only motive for godly living, but a major motive for godly living, for evangelism, which I saw actually take place, especially back in the 70s during the Jesus movement. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many people I talked to who didn't want to be left behind in the rapture. Now, maybe they were all deceived or whatever, but nevertheless, they became believers. And uh, it motivated them to be involved in evangelism and world missions. The second generation of Calvary Chapel has gone and become missionary people like Joe's children. Uh, they've gone to the mission field as the first generation founded churches. And things, and that's because of their belief in the blessed hope that Christ can come at any moment, so we better get after it. So I strongly, even after this discussion, still believe that the New Testament teaches that. Thank, thank you, Tommy. And uh, David, you have uh, five and a half minutes to uh, give us your closing arguments. <clears throat> Well, I don't believe that any of the passages in the New Testament or in the Old Testament teach eminence for the simple reason that it, Christ hasn't come, that it is not near, it is not immediate. We asked the head of the Greek department at Dallas Seminary what the word agus means. He said it means certain. It has nothing to do with time. And we're trying to, um, trying to make the scriptures say something that they don't say when we teach that eminence of Christ. Now, there is the eminence of death. We could, you know, walk across the street and get eaten by an alligator, depending on where we're living. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. We have no assurance. And so that ought to be enough motivation for godly living. We do not know. We have no idea of how long we have on this earth. But we do have some idea of when that we're supposed to be looking for signs. Now, you can't be looking for signs if there's no, if, if his coming is imminent. There's nothing to look for, nothing to watch for. That's right. So we're supposed to be watching. We're supposed to be looking. And we're not going to be overtaken because we ourselves are children of the day. It's not going to occur. We're, it's not going to happen suddenly. Now, I agree with Tommy. Yes, many times those passages mean uh, tech, that it would happen quickly. Whatever is going to happen, it's going to happen quickly rather than giving any particular time in which it's going to happen. And I think that's part of the argument that some people use to try to hold on to eminence. It is, or the preterist we might use that as well. It's supposed to happen, but we have certain things that we can look for and we watch for, 
And then as the time gets closer and closer, we can look more clearly. A lot of people, when they see the Battle of Gog and Magog occur, they're going to wonder what happened. Unless they understand that these things were prophesied to happen before the day of the Lord, which they all were, and I don't see how you can put a gap in there. If you do put a gap in there, yeah, you can make it say anything you want. And all of these prophecies mean nothing because they're not giving you a sign. If we don't have anything to look for, then where is our blessed hope? Let's give these guys a round of applause. And we thank you for coming and sharing your insights.